Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the Reckon Ausdocs webinar, Legal Tips and Traps for SMEs. My name is Charlotte, and I'll be hosting today's webinar. Today's session will run for approximately 45 minutes with time for questions at the end. Questions can be submitted at any time in the question box on your webinar's control panel. Our presenters today are Gary Kendrick and Roxanne Hart. Gary is one of the co-founders of Directional HR and Ausdocs Online, and has spent the last 30 years working for exchange-listed organizations in the UK, US, Europe, and for the last 14 years supporting businesses in Australia and Asia. Gary's passion is small and medium businesses, affording them with big business tools at an affordable price. This has proven to be the case and is being extended with the partnership with Reckon Ausdocs. We're also joined by Roxanne Hart, the director of O-Legal, a commercial law firm that provides cost-effective legal solutions to SMEs, as well as outsourcing services to law firms in Australia and overseas. Roxanne is an experienced commercial corporate lawyer who practiced at one of the highest regarded law firms in Queensland for several years before starting O-Legal. She advises small, medium and large businesses, AXS ASX listed entities, government bodies, and non-for-profits. I will now hand you over to Gary to begin today's presentation. Thank you, Charlotte, and good afternoon, everybody. Um, so for those of you that um, have been, was on the call last month uh, with Roxanne, this is um, the second stage, um, and I've limited my um, slides to just the one, just to remind everybody, um, reckon Ausdocs and what we've got available, because some of the things that um, um, Roxanne will cover as we go through will be access to some of these documents to help with that sort of compliance arena. So uh, for those of you that uh, haven't been on the call before, welcome, and I'll just quickly run through um, the partnership that we have with um, Reckon uh, and ourselves as Reckon Ausdocs. So on the um, site today, there are um, just over 750 compliant legal documents, um, as you can see, covering sort of SME franchise contractor businesses, HR, trust, shareholders, partnerships, policies checklists. So, everything that you could really want um, in a, a business situation. Behind that 750, we do have about another 6,500 documents that sit in our back end. So one of the things we do say to people is, if there is something on the site that you can't find that you're after, um, just click on the uh, contact us button um, or on the chat bot, leave your email or telephone number and we'll do our very best to uh, fulfill that for you. Or in fact, we can also talk to one of our lawyers, such as um, Roxanne, and actually have the document authored for you and put up on the site. Um, the key thing about Reckon Ausdoc, so what's sort of unique about it, the first thing is it's an immediate delivery. Um, as soon as you go on an order, you can then uh, download now, or you can wait um, probably about 30 seconds and an email will come through to you with the word document as an attachment and also send through a tax invoice. So everything is done in less than that 30 second period. Um, purchase um, the documents or the special packs on a pay-as-you-go basis. So the key thing is there, there is no memberships, no subscription fees, no minimums. Um, literally it is when you find a situation that you're in that where you require a document to be able to support the business, be that policies to uh, help with compliance or where you need uh, contractual agreements, um, maybe with contractors. So again, you can just go on, purchase and off you come. Um, there are also connections to um, lawyers and IR and HR experts on the site. It's under something called Ask an Expert. It's on the landing page or the front page. And you can get 15 minute consultations um, with um, specific lawyers or IR, HR experts where you can email them in advance um, your questions, email them in advance the documents to which you may be referring. And therefore, when you start the 15 minute call uh, with the individual, you're straight into um, the detail that you're um, seeking to understand. Um, and very soon, uh, we will also be adding um, police checks, uh, anti-money laundering checks, uh, working with children, so they'll be available. And people have actually asked us one other thing, um, and that is um, the setting up of a company, so company constitution. Um, yes, that will be available um, very, very soon, so within the next few weeks. 
that will be up on our site as well. So that's uh, just a quick intro to Reckon Ausdocs, and I'll now pass over to uh, Roxanne Hart or Roxy to her friends, um, and she will take you through the next sort of 40 minutes um, and give you the tips and traps, as uh, she's called the session, um, for SMEs. So I trust you find that um, very informative indeed. So over to you, Roxy. Thanks, Gary, and thanks for that introduction, Charlotte. So today I'm going to be talking about a few different legal tips and traps for SMEs, uh, and I hope this is going to be practical for you. A few of these um, things, such as reviewing a contract, are provided in on the basis that you could then print them out later and then use them um, in your business and share them around with your team. So I'll be covering um, contract reviews, shareholders agreements, uh, employee share schemes, the PPSR, and um, tips for reducing your legal spend today. So into um, reviewing a contract, if you've got a contract that comes across your desk and it's um, not of the size or the do dollar value which warrants being sent out to the lawyers to have a look at, then this is um, a bit of a checklist which I'd advise you to use um, for things that you should be looking out for. So the first one is, does the contract contain any exclusivity clause? For example, um, if you are being provided services or goods by somebody, does it prevent you from using somebody else to provide those goods or services to you for the duration of the contract? Or are you free to use whoever you want and vice versa? It might be beneficial to you um, to include an exclusivity clause in your favour. The next is assignment rights. So being able to assign a contract can be um, very handy for your business, especially if you're able to assign without consent uh, or just on giving notice. So this is handy in the case that you might want to um, sell your business or um, do a restructure, which re requires that all of your contracts are going to be moved across to a different entity. So if you don't have any assignment rights under the contract, then that could give the other party the right to terminate in the event that you did want to assign, um, which is obviously not very good. So I recommend um, checking that all of your contracts would include an assignment rights going forward. And something um, that's a bit of a trap that you should look out for is if you are um, a party to a contract, it might say that you're deemed to have assigned your rights under the agreement if you undertake a change in control of your shares in your company. So let's say you have a company and 50% um, of the shares are sold to somebody else, or well, that could be deemed an assignment that needs consent. And if you haven't gone and gotten consent before doing that, then um, the other party might be able to terminate the contract. The next um, trap to always look out for is what are your termination rights and what penalties are payable if you terminate early or if you don't comply with the um, with any notice periods or other requirements. And this next point ties into it, which is automatic extension. So a bit of a trap um, hidden inside some contracts is an automatic extension, which means that if you don't terminate your agreement within a certain period of time before it's supposed to end, so for example, um, 30 days or 60 days before the anticipated termination date, then the contract may automatically extend for a further period, which could be um, quite a long period of time. So for example, it could uh, extend for another year or another five years or whatever it may be. And there might be additional fees payable um, for the new term as well. So not only are you locked in for a long time, but you're also locked in at those fees um, that they've stated and you don't have an opportunity to negotiate. So very important to check if your contract's got this. But on the other hand, if you are giving somebody else a contract and you're providing them goods and services, you might want this automatic extension clause because uh, chances are your customers after a few years are going to forget that it's in there and that they might not terminate in time. The next point to look for is what security is required under the contract. So it might be that you're required to grant a security interest in all of your present and after acquired property, um, which is that security interest term under the PPSA, um, which means that you're effectively giving the other party a mortgage over all of your personal assets or the assets of your business. Uh, or alternatively, you might have to give a personal guarantee. And we all know um, the effect of a personal um, guarantee is that it could expose your assets 
if um, the entity that you're guaranteeing will comply does not actually comply. So it's quite quite risky to get a to give a guarantee, and you should always consider the risks of doing this. The next point is to look out for um, representation clauses. So this is pretty common. Most contracts will say in there that this is the entire agreement between the parties uh, and any representations that anybody made before the contract was signed are not enforceable and are invalid. So for example, if you're purchasing something, some goods or services, and the other parties represented to you that they can have it done by a certain date or that it will comply with certain requirements or be useful for this or that, then you need to ensure that that's actually in the contract or that you have an email or something which has that, and then you get rid of the entire agreement clause, um, which says that this is the entire agreement. Uh, and conversely, if you are the person providing the goods or services, you probably want to include something like this. All contracts should also clearly set out the performance obligations of both parties and also um, deal with the liability. So generally, if you're a providing the goods or services, you want to limit your, your liability to the extent permitted by law and vice versa. If you're the person acquiring goods or services, of course, you want the other person to be liable if something goes wrong. So it depends which side of the table you're on, um, but I would generally recommend if you are trying to negotiate out of any liability, then most businesses won't agree to that. So what I have found tends to work is limiting your liability to either the amount of fees paid in the last couple of months under the contract or just the amount of fees pay, paid in the last month under the contract to you. So businesses tend to um, be able to, to let that one pass. Next uh, aspect of a contract to consider is what what actually constitutes a breach under the contract and what happens if there is a breach. So if you are being provided something or um, you know, if you're a party to a contract, you need to work out, okay, what, what's, my, um, what's my really important terms? So if you're a contractor, for example, it might be getting paid on time. If you're being supplied um, goods or services, it might be receiving something on time. So you need to have a look at those clauses and you need to then check the breach section and make sure that if those clauses aren't complied with, then there is an appropriate process um, or you have appropriate rights to deal with that breach and that it actually constitutes a breach because some breaches won't actually be a breach unless they happen on a few different occasions or if you've given a certain amount of notice um, to the party to try and rectify it before you can actually ex exercise any rights. But if those things are very important to you, then you might want the right to terminate immediately as opposed to giving a rectification period. This um, case that I'll put in here, it relates to how um, negotiation can sometimes be binding on people and how contracts don't always have to be in writing. So it was a recent one and it concerned a consultancy agreement and um, a, some dispute over development profits. And the, the dispute ultimately went to court. And during um, the court period, the parties decided to try and settle the matter and, um, and you know, walk away and not, not finish the court proceeding. So they did some negotiations. Uh, the defendant made an offer to the plaintiff um, to pay them 450 grand and give them a two bedroom unit. So the plaintiff said, okay, sure, we have a deal. And then they talked a little bit about the payment terms and the apartment terms. Later that night, the defendant solicitor sent the plaintiff solicitor um, details that were negotiated that day. And, uh, you know, it was just a brief summary. Okay, this is what we agreed today. Um, now we'll draw up an agreement. Then the plaintiff said, actually, that's not the agreement that was, um, that was made or I can get a better deal. So I'm not actually going to be accepting, like going forward with this agreement. It was then um, brought before the court and the court held that the email um, was a record of terms that were agreed by the parties during the negotiations earlier that day. And because other people had been around, they'd heard the plaintiff say, yep, we, we have an agreement. And even though they hadn't spelled out every single term of their agreement or actually signed any documents, this was enough to constitute a binding agreement. So the plaintiff was bound by the deal that they had agreed to occur, you know, that day. So this is important because 
it highlights that you need to say in your in any negotiations or any emails um, that are about an agreement whether or not you intend it to be binding. So if you don't say something, then chances are it could be binding, even if you haven't actually signed any agreement or you know you don't think it is going to be binding. And um, there's been a lot of similar cases in the last few years, especially in leasing as well. So email negotiations around leases have been held to constitute actual leases and there's been uh, several, several other similar cases. The next topic in um, today's seminar is the Personal Property Securities Act. So this is just a little bit of a refresher on what the PPSA does, um, how you comply with the PPSA and what happens if you don't comply, as well as a couple of um, quite interesting cases which have arisen. And because the PPSA is a little bit new, um, we're still getting a lot of case law that's uh, you know, confirming how the PPSA is going to be interpreted by the courts. So it's an interesting time. So as a bit of a background, the PPSA came in in 2012. It uh, creates a creates regulations for dealing with what's known as security interests. And what a security interest is, I like to think of it as similar to a mortgage over land. It's like a mortgage over other property that's not land. So all business assets, inventory, cars, really anything except for land. So what the, what's the importance of this is that a lot of arrangements that you might um, just enter into and not think about as being covered by this regime are actually covered by this regime. For example, if you're entering into retention of um, title arrangements, higher purchase agreements, uh, if you're just bailing goods with somebody else, if you're leasing uh, a piece of equipment or a car or other goods um, for a certain period of more than two years, or um, yeah, undertaking any other sort of types of leases for that period of time, then you've got what's called a security interest. So why, why is this important? Well, it's important because if you don't recognise that you've got a security interest, and then you don't comply with the PPSA, if the um, person that you've given your goods to suffers an insolvency event, or if they sell the goods, you have very limited rights, particularly in the case of insolvency. So let's say um, I was, I, I got a car from, I, I just bought a car and I got finance for it from ANZ, for example. And let's say um, ANZ, hasn't registered their security interest in the car because, you know, as I said before, it's really um, a type of higher purchase arrangement or a finance arrangement. So they haven't registered their security interest. Um, I go off and sell the car to somebody else. Now that third party, because ANZ hasn't registered their security interest, is going to take that car free of the security interest. Uh, so that means that ANZ's lost their ability to recover the car. Conversely, if they had registered a security interest, then the third party would take subject to that. And the whole point of the PPSA is it's a public register. So somebody who's you know, a buyer, they can go and have a quick look online at the PPSA and say, okay, yep, yeah, there is a security interest registered over this car. I need to make sure that that's dealt with before I actually buy it because I don't want to buy it subject to ANZ's interest. The other um, side of the coin is Let's say I wasn't selling it. Let's just say I suffered an insolvency event and a bank, a trustee in bankruptcy was appointed to me. So the trustee comes in um, and they check, okay, has ANZ registered their security interest? If they haven't, well, that means that the car now belongs to the trustee and ANZ is just a normal unsecured creditor and they will just have to fight with the rest of the other unsecured creditors to try and uh, recover whatever's left. So it's an so the PPS, they um, also created the PPSR, which is that public register I talked about. So it's it's quite an interesting um, piece of legislation. And if you get it wrong, then it, the consequences can be pretty disastrous. A couple of things to bear in mind when you're dealing with the PPSA. Uh, the first thing is that you need your security interest to effectively attach to whatever property you are securing. So generally what, what that means in a nutshell is you need to have a written agreement which says, yep, I have a security interest in whatever property it is. So you could say I have a security interest in all of your property, for example, um, to secure payment of 
payment for services or goods, or you could just have a security interest in a specific piece of property, such as that situation, ANZ having a security interest in a car. The next step is the security interest needs to be perfected, and usually that happens by registering it on the PPS register. So two things, you need, to, you need it to be in writing and then you need to register it on the PPSR. And then the next point um, in respect to the PPSR is you need to make sure that you do the registration right because if you just make one little mistake in your registration, unfortunately it can be invalid and then um, let's say the person has an insolvency event, then it means that, they, um, that you could lose your goods. So I, I had a, an arrangement recently. I actually spoke about it at the last um, at the last webinar I did, and I was saying I had this client, and he has some um, like one piece of mining equipment. So he's actually in in a limo business or something like that. But he has this piece of equipment that he read, he um, leases out to certain mining sites. So he's not really up to speed with the PPSR because it's not his main source of business. And I was chatting to him about it and it turns out, yep, he's been giving this piece of equipment out for a period of longer than two years. So that's obviously very high risk. He needs to have um, he needs to have a registration on the PPSR to protect himself. So I told him that. And I also said you need to have a written agreement with these people because if you don't, then your P then despite having a registration on the PPSR, your registration could actually be invalid. But um, he didn't want to put in a written agreement because that he was quite um, quite good mates with all of his mining friends. But that's just an example. Um, of where, okay, I had to go and look at the legislation and see, yep, you do have to have a security agreement and the security agreement actually has to be in writing. Uh, so unfortunately, that guy doesn't have one, but maybe in the future. Roxy, it's Gary. Um, just uh, yep. another question, just while you were going through that, and again, it might be relevant to everyone on the call. Um, one of the yep. things that I heard recently, and maybe you can, uh, so this was um, something directly from a client who um, mm -hmm. was employing people to work at home to do some coding on particular projects. Um, again, mm -hmm. those contracts were sort of 12 to 18 months, and he was actually providing a very sort of high grade um, laptops and PCs for them to work on. Um, from their yep. home premise and one of the guys said well hang on a minute you've given me the PC mm -hmm. and leaving and he said well that PC is mine now um, and tried yep. to sort of leave with the PC that caused quite a few issues is is that the sort of thing you're talking about also under the PPSA it, it's a little bit different so the PPSA applies more when you're trying to secure payment for something so in the case um, so for example take that car case where I said, okay, I'll have a car, but ANZ's given me some finance for it. Um, the reason that they've got a security interest over the car is because they want to secure payment from me. So that's really the essence of a security interest is just securing some payment. Whereas in this employment um, situation that you're telling me about, um, when an employer gives the employees computers, they're not really securing any payment from the um, employees. It's, it's just it's the employer's property, um, so no security interest is ever created, and that means that the PPSA doesn't apply to it. So if okay. the employee say suffers a bankruptcy event, um, it, it's this the computers aren't covered by this legislation, and the employer would get them back um, because it remains the employer's property. So there's no requirement for them to register a security interest in that case. Yeah, but it might be. Um, uh, perhaps what, no, it would be the same in a contractor case because you're not really securing um, payment from the from the employer or the contractor yeah okay That's good question uh, i guess it, it sounds quite similar to this arrangement mm. great okay then the next uh the next point is with the security interest you do get some enforcement rights um that come with that so for example you might have the right to come and um, come and seize and sell the property that you've secured and a few other rights under the legislation uh, something else to note is that when you register your security interest, you might not be the first person to have a security interest over the particular piece of property, particularly if you're not securing something that you've supplied. Uh, it's more so if you're securing all present and after acquired property of the um, person, which is, which is kind of, um, or used to be referred to as a floating charge. So, uh, yeah, it's important to check what, what order your, what priority your security interest is going to take based on when it was first registered. So a couple of recent cases. Uh, the first one concerned General Electric and they leased 
um, four mobile gas turbine generators valued at $44 million to a company called Forge. So unfortunately, um, General Electric did not do their security interest um, registration on the PPSR and Forge suffered an insolvency event. Uh, it had administrators appointed to it. So Forge then, um, Forge's administrators sought an order from the court which said, yep, we, um, we have the rights to the turbines, they became our property because GE didn't register their security interest. And GE said, no, no, the, um, the turbines are fixtures. Um, Remember I said before, the, um, the PBSR doesn't apply to real property, so it also doesn't apply to fixtures, which is in essence something that becomes attached to the land or, or the property. So GE was trying to say, okay, these massive turbines, they're huge, you can't easily move them, we drop them off on the land, uh, they're basically attached to the land, so they're not covered here. Unfortunately for GE, the court held that the turbines were not fixtures um, because even though they were extremely large and very heavy, um, you could still move them around, like a truck could come and collect them. They weren't nailed into the ground or anything. Therefore, they fell within the scope of the PPSA. And because GE failed to register, uh, meant that it lost its turbines by 44 million upon the appointment of the administrators. So a massive loss for GE. Uh, just to give you an idea on pricing of the PPSR, costs about seven bucks to register a security interest. Uh, and yeah, security agreements aren't very expensive either. So for the sake of maybe a grand or even less, if they already had a good security agreement, like maybe even just for the sake of the seven dollar registration, they could have avoid losing their goods. Now, uh, this case um, just came out recently and it, it concerns not doing a registration properly. So all leasing, it had some crushing and screening of equipment valued at 25 mil, and it leased them out to a company called One Steel. So the parties had a rental agreement. Uh, it, it confirmed that the, that the rental was actually a PPS lease, was covered by the PPSR. So um, all leasing went onto the, the PPSR registered its security interest, but it registered against one steel's ABN rather than the ACN. And the PPS regulations have a list of um, priorities in terms of what you need to register against. So ultimately they say, if an organization has an ACN, like an Australian company number, you need to re register it against that first. Uh, if it doesn't have an ACN, then you'd register, say, I don't know, against the ABN. If it doesn't have that, then you register against its name. So it's got a whole list of priorities, it depends on what type of organisation it is, say if it's a company, a trust or an individual. And unfortunately here, it was registered against the wrong grant or identifier. So you think, okay, it's not really that much of a big deal, um, they just got it slightly wrong. But unfortunately, the court held that the registration was defective and misleading and contravened the PPSA. So all leasing lost its... Um, crushing and screening equipment valued at 25 mil, which is very unfortunate for it. So very important to get the registrations right. And if you're not sure, um, seek some legal advice. And the PPS website also has very good information as to what you should register against. On to the next topic, uh, employee share schemes. So I've been seeing a, a lot of these come across my desk lately. Uh, they've become very popular again in the last couple of years um, because of some tax concessions which came in. So that now employee share schemes are much more favourably taxed in Australia. And that came about from the whole um, innovation boom which Australia uh, was said to have gone through in the last couple of years. So, uh, in a nutshell, why should you use a scheme? Well, as the name suggests, employee share schemes, they give employees a bit of ownership of the organisation, uh, so that can definitely increase job satisfaction, retention rates, uh, and it can um, align the interests of an employee with the company, and it can also uh, be an alternative to giving cash incentives, which provide more short-term um, results for a business as opposed to long-term results. And also an employee share scheme, because you don't have to give out physical cash, can be a lot easier on cash flow. 
there's a few different options which I'll quickly run through. The first is your classic employee share scheme. The second is an employee option scheme. And the third is what I'd call a phantom share plan. So an employee share scheme is where um, shares are issued to an employee either upfront or over time uh, as the employee remains with the business. So at each tranche, the employee will be issued shares and um, it can give the employee some rights. So you could have that the employee has voting rights or you could have that they don't have voting rights. Uh, and it can also give the employee access to dividends. So that's an additional financial incentive for them. But realistically, um, employee share schemes, although used in massive organisations, the um, purpose of the tax concessions, which I mentioned earlier, were brought in so that employee share schemes were more attractive to early stage companies and startups. So you're not really going to be giving out dividends if you're one of those, but the um, the big the, or the goal, I guess, for the employees is that there's going to be a sale or a listing of the organisation in the future and that's when they're going to cash out. The tax, oh, just in a nutshell, what the tax concessions are, um, they give a discount um, and they also defer the taxing point for any discounts given um, under an employee share scheme. So previously, if you gave an employee a substantial discount um, on the purchase price of the shares or, or if you impose no purchase price and the shares were actually kind of valuable, then the employee could be taxed up front on the discount that they're given, which is very unattractive and prevented a lot of people from using these schemes. So now, as long as the, there's no less than a 15% um, discount to fair market value, then uh, that's just disregarded. And there's also um, a few other tax concessions around capital gains tax. The next one is uh, employee option schemes. So very similar to an employee share scheme, except the employee is given an option to purchase the shares at each point in time, as opposed to the shares automatically vesting in the employee. And there's a few different reasons why you might do this. Uh, the first is you could require the employee to pay an amount at each option um, stage. And you can do that with shares, but it's quite common with an option to have that. And uh, there's just a different agreement that's to be used and the, the um, you can defer the option vesting time until much further in the future, which then also defers the point in time where the employee can um, have any voting rights or dividend rights. There's slightly different rules regarding the tax concessions for option schemes as well. And a phantom share plan. Ultimately, or in a nutshell, what phantom share plans are, um, they can be either profit your classic profit share agreements. So it's where an employee is getting a percentage of the, um, of the profits of the business, or it could be an improvement, um, improvement plan that might be linked to KPIs for the business as a whole or to the shareholder, uh, depending on their performance and depending on the company's performance, then the employee might um, receive a percentage of um, the improved company's profits at a certain point in time. So unlike a normal uh, employee share scheme or an employee option plan, the employees don't actually receive any shares in the uh, in the business. They just receive a right to receive cash. So it, it kind of mimics the income yield and capital growth of shares without actually giving them away. Next um, point is five ways a shareholders agreement will save your business some money. Unfortunately, I see this all the time. Uh, businesses come to us when it's too late, when uh, everybody's in dispute, and unfortunately, a lot of the arguments that we see could have been resolved if there was a good shareholders agreement in place at the start. The reason why you do it at the start is because when you're starting out a business with somebody, you're getting along very well with them, and it's much easier to just sit down and agree on an agreement and sign it then and there, as opposed to waiting a couple of years when people have changed, um, people's lives lives have changed, they've got new people in their life, they've got different goals, uh, and they could you could then um, have a dispute. So the first um, the first key point of a shareholders agreement is what it is. It's a contract between the shareholders. It governs the relationship between them. It really sets the scene for how the business is going to be managed. Uh, it says who is going to be the directors 
and it really provides an avenue for everybody to consider a few important matters up front that can get um, lost as you start getting very busy running your business. Most importantly, it says how decisions are going to be made, which is very important where you're going to have two or more shareholders in a business. It can say that what decisions are to be made by a simple majority. So most decisions will just be made by more than 51% agreeing on the decision, uh, but it can also reserve some decisions for 75% or unanimous approval. So that could be a decision such as, okay, do we change the entire direction of the business? Or we might want 100% approval before we do that. Or do we go out and raise capital? Or do we sell the business? So these sorts of decisions can uh, require a, a higher percentage agreement. It, can also, it will also set out what to do in the event of a deadlock. So a deadlock is where you have a 50-50 um, split over a decision. Let's say you have two shareholders. So one shareholder voted one way, the other shareholder voted the other way, and now the business can't really move forward. It's in a deadlock. A couple of ways of dealing with that, uh, which should be set out in the shareholders agreement. The first is somebody has a casting vote. The second is somebody um, can... Oh, the, sorry, the second is that the decision just simply isn't passed, but then you're left in a situation of one very unhappy shareholder who can then also make the other shareholder's life very difficult. Third option is you could do what's called a shotgun clause, and that's where one shareholder offers to sell their shares to the other shareholder, and then the other shareholder says yes or no. If they decide not to buy that shareholder's shares, then they have to sell their shares to the um, shareholder who originally offered. But ultimately what happens is one of the shareholders exits and then the other shareholders left in the business running it and can move forward and run it in the direction that they want. And hopefully the other shareholder who exited is also happy because they've gotten some money for their shares and then they can go off and, and do their own thing. But if you can see, um, if, if you don't have this written down in agreement, you can see how easily it is that disputes are going to arise. The shareholders agreement establishes accountability. So generally you would set out um, who's doing what, who's managing the day-to-day -day obligations, oh, sorry, the day-to-day -day, yeah, obligations of the business, um, who's, who's just sitting there as a non-executive director who's more in an advisory capacity, uh, who is managing finances. And it can really, it can say whatever you want it to say, but it really just establishes accountability and makes everybody very clear on who's doing what. And if you can't agree on these things up front, then there's not really much point in going into the business anyway. So you're much better off um, getting sorted from day one. Generally also has a, a dispute resolution clause. Another really important point um, that's contained in a shareholders agreement is how a party can sell or transfer their shares or exit. Usually, in a smaller, a small to medium-sized business, you would not want one of the shareholders to be able to just sell their shares to anybody, um, exit the business, and then leave the other shareholder in business with somebody that they don't necessarily know or like. That's that's not what the deal was from day one. So what we would normally say in a shareholders agreement is before a shareholder goes off and sells their shares to somebody else, they have to give the other shareholders an opportunity to buy their shares first at whatever price the third party's offered or at market value, uh, depending on what the parties want to put in there. It can also uh, include what's known as drag and tag along, right? These are important, particularly if you are in a business and you're a majority shareholder or a minority shareholder, and the type of business is such that there might be a sale in the future of the entire business. So, or, or a listing. So a drag along right means that if you're the majority shareholder and let's say you've got 75% of the shares and there's somebody who wants to buy the entire business and you think, oh no, you know, I can't sell um, the entire business because I've only got 75% of the shares. Well, what a drag along clause does is it entitles you to force the other shareholder, the minority holding that 25% stake to sell their shares as well. So then you can make a sale of 100% of the business. Conversely, a tag along right is if you're 
a minority shareholder, let's say you're that 25%, and you see the 75% shareholder selling their shares for that third party, you might think, oh, you know, I don't want to just be left as a minority shareholder with this new um, third party who comes in. I want to sell as well and get some of the upside from the sale. So a tag along right gives you a right to literally tag along to the sale, sell your shares to the third party as well. They have to give you an opportunity to do that. So these are, those are a couple of um, clauses which are very popular these days and um, depending on the nature of your business and what percentage of the shares you hold, you might want to consider including these. Shareholders agreements also deal with unexpected exits. For example, if a shareholder becomes disabled or dies, uh, or even if they um, get a divorce and their shares are transferred to their ex-partner, which can be very uncomfortable for the shareholder who's left in the business um, to then be dealing with the ex-partner of the other shareholder, then you can have some clauses in there which deal with, okay, what's to happen in that case. Normally, uh, what I'd say is that you would um, have a, the shareholder who's left in the business has a right to purchase the other shareholder's shares at market value. You could also include in there um, what's called a buy and sell agreement and that requires a party to have insurance for these sort of situations, particularly if they pass away, um, which then enables the other shareholder to buy out that um, the shareholder who's died can buy the share, he can buy those shares. Okay, uh, this is quite an interesting um, topic for businesses always. It's how can you reduce your legal spend? The first point I'll make is that there is a lot of very good technology out there these days that is available to businesses, uh, particularly in the contract management space and uh, even in the contract review space, which can do some pretty basic things, um, which can really streamline your processes for dealing with contracts and getting to the signing stage and then um, managing contracts uh, post-signing. So I definitely recommend having a look what's out there in that space. Next tip would be to regularly examine your business before it's too late. So for example, I would um, do a search of, okay, what are common business documents that businesses have in place? And then check, okay, do I have all of those? For example, do I have my shareholders agreement? Do I have good terms and conditions? Do I have um, proper policies for the business? Do I have good employment contracts? You know, if you don't have these things, then it's time to get them is when things are going good, uh, because when they go bad, it's too late. And um, Ausdocs Online has some fantastic policy packs that you could um, also have a look at on there if you identify a need when you do your internal audit. I'd always recommend looking for fixed fee um, legal advice. It's you know a, a substantial number of very good law firms these days will offer their services on a fixed fee. So if you're getting a quote from a firm and um, and they say it's an estimate or even if it looks like a fixed fee, but later on in the retainer, it actually says this is an estimate only. What I would do if I were you, I'd go back and I'd say, look, um, note that this is just an estimate. Uh, I'll go after a fixed fee. Can you please confirm that this is a fixed fee? And chances are the firm would say yes. There's a lot of competition these days in the legal space. Uh, so there is opportunity to negotiate and to uh, lock in fixed fees. And that can definitely save you a lot of money in the long run, um, especially if you're getting any amendments and things like that made. Uh, Ausdocs Online also offers uh, all their documents for a fixed fee, as Gary mentioned, and also has uh, Ask an Expert um, legal advice sessions for a fixed fee. Okay, well, that's, um, that's it for me. So I hope that you've gotten a few practical tips that you might be able to take away and use in your business um, from a legal perspective. If you ever have any questions, please feel free to reach out for me, um, to me. I'd love to hear from you. Um, but otherwise, over to you, Gary and Charlotte. Yeah, great. Um, Roxy, thank you very much indeed. And um, uh, as I, I, I do speak to you often, but uh, when you go through some of those presentations, some of the things that sort of come out um, do send shivers down the spine. So um, just as maybe a little bit of a review, I just made a couple of notes um, for myself. Um, so maybe as a, a revise for everybody on the call, the assignment rights, um, shareholders agreement. So both of those things seem to be uh, really prominent. Um, the other thing I know that everyone's aware of, but it always comes back to bite them, and that is emails. 
Um, someone always told me, so when um, I actually ran a business that was um, looking into um, emails on litigation cases, um, it, my the a piece of advice I was always given is, if you're not happy for everybody in the world to read what you're writing in an email, don't write it. Um, because the chances are it will get out there somehow. Either you'll send it to the wrong person or somebody that you've sent it to adds it to a chain of emails and out it goes. And again, that can be you know used against you so many times, um, especially in the HR environment. Um, the other one, um, Roxy, that you covered, the loss of $44 million worth of equipment for the sake of a $7 registration fee. I mean, you know, that is just an enormous wake up call um, for big business. Um, and it doesn't matter whether, you know, to the size of, um, I think it was GE that you mentioned, um, you know, that might be a bit of a, you know, it will definitely be a dent in their books. Um, but in a smaller organization, you know, that could be a thousand dollars. It could be five thousand dollars. It could be ten thousand dollars. And it still has a, a big impact because, you know, you've made that um, um, loss. Um, in the business. So again, that is something hugely to be aware of. And um, thank you, Roxy, in your presentation for mentioning um, policies. Um, you know, it is something that we preach on about is companies having those policies so that at least if anything does go to court, they can actually prove that they're, uh, you know, a competent and compliant um, organization, company, um, that they do have these policies in place and there is a responsibility upon, you know, people like employees. So thank you indeed, Roxy. Really appreciate that um, and your time. Um, and for everybody on the call, I'm sure that's the same. I know they can't speak, but I'm hopefully I'm speaking for them. Um, so over to you, Charlotte, if there's um, any questions and hopefully that gave everyone a little bit of time uh, that they might be able to um, type some questions um, to forward on to Charlotte. Thanks, Gary, and thanks so much, Roxy, for your presentation. That was that was really great. Um, there have just been a few questions that have come through. Um, on the last legal update from Roxanne, um, you advise that business and policy packs would be made available on your site. Are these now available? Um, yes, they are. Um, so, yes, I did make the commitment. I remember doing it um, and said they would be up a week on Friday from the last one. And they were actually up um, a week on Friday at noon. So, yes, if you go onto the website, um, if you go into the uh, blue browse box, click in there. Um, I think it's the third one down. It says business packs um, already at a 20 percent discount. So we have discounted those packs by 20% um, so that anybody on um, the Reckon webinar calls can go in there, select those and get them at that discounted rate. So um, yes, thank you for the reminder, uh, but I did do as I promised. Thanks, Gary. Um, another question. If we're wanting to engage Roxanne on the homepage under Ask an Expert Commercial Lawyer um, with the 15 minute consultation, is it possible to have that after hours, say after 6 p.m., where there is no one in the office to overhear that conversation? Uh, I'll hand yeah, it to um, I do after hours consultations, it's no problem. Okay, that's okay, great. Excellent, thank you. <laughs> um, last question here. Um, will Reckon Ausdocs be at the ICC Accounting Expo tomorrow and Thursday? Uh, yes, we're, so as Ausdocs online, and obviously yeah, for any um, Reckon clients under Reckon Ausdocs, um, yeah, we are actually at the expo. So um, if anybody um, is flying into state and coming in for it, or in the Sydney area, um, then um, please feel free to um, come down. And in fact, I think if you um, send an email through um, to training at reckon.com.au. Um, Charlotte can organise a, a free ticket as well. So if you actually turn up on the day, I think it's uh, from memory about $60. Um, but as I say, if you send uh, an email through to training at reckon.com.au, um, Charlotte can send you out um, a free ticket. So, Sorry, uh, just to go. clarify, the email is training at reckon.com. There's no .au on the end, just in case anyone wanted to come oh. through. <laughs> Sorry about that. That's Thank okay. you, Charlotte. Um, I'm not sure if anyone else wanted to submit a question while we have a few minutes left. 
Otherwise, a recording of today's session along with the presentation slides will be available on our Reckon Training Academy. So you're more than welcome to log in there and, and watch again the first, uh, first webinar and also this one again if you have a chance. Not sure. Um, and yeah, you I want suppose to... the final thing I've got is that there um, will be some more um, webinars that we'll be putting together. Um, we do have again um, one of the um, top 12 um, HR consultants in the world today um, will be joining us for um, another session. So one of the things I would ask if there's, I know um, there's still a few people on the call, um, if there is something that you want to specifically hear um, in the sort of um, an HR type environment, again, if you use that email that Charlotte gave with um, out the AU on the end, um, if there's anything that you want, then we'll get that added into the webinar um, and give you that advice, as I say, from one of the um, top 12 people uh, in the world today. That's great. Thanks, Gary. Um, I think we might end the session there then. There's been no more questions submitted. So thank you again, Gary, and thanks so much, Roxanne. Um, and thank you, everyone, for attending. We hope to see you at our next series. Great. Thanks, Charlotte. Thank you.